Greetings and welcome to another Victoria Symphony pre-concert video. This is for a live concert happening this February 6th at UVic. It's the third concert in a three-part series of concerts featuring Robert Schumann and his circle. The music of his contemporaries, such as his wife Clara, the Mendelssohn siblings, Felix and Fanny, of course Johannes Brahms. And this concert will feature a composer on whom Schumann must have had a profound influence, namely Gustav Mahler. Each of these concerts has um, also featured a new work by a Canadian composer. Uh, if you remember back last fall, the other two concerts featured works by Jocelyn Morlock and Jacques Hétieu. This one will feature a brand new work, one that we have commissioned from Linda Catlin Smith. Now this has been made possible by a bequest from the late Hugh Davidson. Many of you concert goers will know Hugh. He was a champion of Canadian music and a great friend of the Victoria Symphony. After a long career in Ottawa as a composer, music advisor, officer of the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, Hugh settled in Victoria and for many years he served as a programming advisor and a board member for the Victoria Symphony. Hugh passed away in 2014, but he left a legacy so that we could continue to encourage young composers and commission new works from established composers. So we're really pleased to include a new work on this program. The work we're premiering is entitled Tableau, and it's by Linda Catlin Smith. Linda was born in the United States, but since the 1970s, she's been based in Canada. She studied here at the University of Victoria, so she has a local connection, and she settled in Toronto in the early 80s. This is our first commission from her. We've performed other works from her in the past, and we're thrilled once again to be bringing a new work to life. As I've mentioned before, it's a very special moment when a piece of music performed by a group of people hits the air for the first time. Now, as the title suggests, Tableau is about imagery. In this case, it's what she describes as very distinct sonic images. I had a chance to talk to Linda about the piece beforehand. She likes to use a lot of variation in her work, so like with many other composers, you will hear fragments, motifs, uh, melodic material that developed and varied throughout the piece. She draws a lot on a lot of different influences in her work, everything from the, the lightness and the textures of Baroque music right through to the very rich harmonic language of 20th century composers like Debussy and Ravel. It's a very good complement to the other works on this program as orchestral texture is also of course a very important part of the works of Mahler. It's been a while since we've performed a piece of new music live with the composer present in front of an audience. She's going to be here for both the performance and the rehearsal process, so I really look forward to that collaboration. The Schumann work we are featuring on this program is his second symphony in C major. Now the second symphony, it's actually the third of the four symphonies that he left us. The one that we call the fourth was actually published last, but it was composed first. And it's another one of those silly, confusing things about the way composers number their works. So the work that we know now as the second symphony, which we're going to play for you, is from around 1847, so less than a decade before Schumann died. We've just come off our Beethoven marathon, performing symphonies one through eight in just two weekends, so it's really easy to draw comparisons with Beethoven when you're talking about Schumann's second symphony. And by the way, as an aside, we decided sort of at the last minute to record all of the Beethoven symphonies for you. So you can look forward to seeing those online. And Christian has prepared pre-concert introductions to all eight of those. We talked a lot about how Beethoven wrote some of his most cheerful music when he was at the low points in his life. Beethoven's Second Symphony, for example, was written at the time when he was struggling with the loss of his hearing. Schumann's Second Symphony was written at a similar low point now you'll recall in my 
previous talks that Schumann was plagued with mental illness for much of his life. He was severely depressed around the time of the composition of the second. Yet, it has some of the most beautiful and cheerful music, um, especially the closing movement. There's a lot to unpack in the symphony, but I thought I would play you the opening section and I'll put up a slide of just the melody part of it. This is uh, the theme that's played by the brass, the horns, the trumpet, and the alto trombone. You'll hear this as a recurring element in all the other movements of the piece, including at the end of the second movement and the final movement. So this is the opening uh, segment of Schumann's second symphony. Now, the last two times we performed this symphony, I talked a fair bit about the second movement, the scherzo. Again, it's a tip of the hat to Beethoven. He did the same thing in his ninth symphony. He put the scherzo as a second movement when it's normally the third movement of a four-movement symphony. Now, this scherzo by Schumann is a real serious tour de force of virtuosity for our first violins. As I mentioned before in these talks, it's on every audition list of excerpts to play when you're trying to secure a job as a violinist in a symphony orchestra. The last time we performed this, I captured a bit of the scherzo in rehearsal for our musicians of the Victoria Symphony social media page. In fact, in fact this clip is actually still up there. Here's a little bit of that rehearsal. This is from 2019. It's nice to see the orchestra in what I call the before time. 
Um, the conductor, by the way, in that clip is Giordano Bellincampi, and fingers crossed, he'll be guest conducting us later on in this season. Also, fun fact, Giordano was one of our music director Christian's conducting teachers. After the Schumann, we move on to works of Gustav Mahler. You'll remember last fall, 2021, we performed the Ninth Symphony of Mahler. Now, I did my long Mahler speech back then, and you can still find that on the Victoria Symphony's YouTube channel. So if you want a longer bit of narrative about the life and work of Mahler, just go to the Victoria Symphony's YouTube channel page, which you might actually even be on right now if you're watching this on YouTube and click on videos. You don't have to scroll too far to find it. Now we'll be performing, first of all, a short piece entitled Blumina, which had its origin as a piece of incidental music for a play entitled Der Trompeter von Säckingen. That means the trumpeters of Säckingen. When Mahler wrote his first symphony, the piece that we now know as Blumina, was actually its original second movement. But Mahler cut it after the work's premiere, which was not well received, by the way. And he excised it from subsequent versions and performances of this symphony. Now, some have argued to put it back. In fact, when we last performed Mahler's first symphony, which was in Christian's first full season, Christian and I did the live pre-concert talk. Remember those live pre-concert talks? And someone actually asked us in the audience if we were going to insert the Blue Mina movement into the symphony. Well, we didn't, but if you're out there, whoever asked us that, shout out to you. We're going to play it on this concert. Now, this is one of Mahler's most tuneful and idyllic pieces. As, as you would guess from its origin, it focuses on the trumpet. It's a very beautiful, beautiful trumpet solo in this very short piece. And it will remind you a lot of the next group of songs by Mahler. These were originally meant to be separate publications, but they were eventually grouped together and published together. And they're known as the Rückert Lieder. Um, they're named after the librettist. The texts are by Friedrich Rückert, who is a 19th century German poet who inspired many composers to set his text to music. Uh, Wikipedia reports that there are actually 121 different musical settings of his poetry. I would recommend before you go to this concert, hopefully you're watching this before the concert, go look up Rickert Leader in uh, your Google search engine. And the search term I usually add to it is the title of the work and then the words text and translation. You usually get good results when you do this and you can read the poems before the concert. It's always really good whenever we're doing vocal music so that you're not shuffling paper around during the show. Now, we're going to be joined on this concert by the Canadian mezzo-soprano Alison McHardy. Local opera fans will recognize her. She's recently performed Britain's, uh, Benjamin Britten's Cantata Fedra with us, with Pacific Opera, and we streamed that last summer. Uh, major roles, she sang the role of Carmen in 2012 with us. That was the last time we performed that opera. And hopefully we're going to do it again very soon. It's been postponed twice now due to you know what. So I'm hoping very soon that we'll do Carmen again. It takes a very special kind of voice to sing Mahler. He uses all of the available colors of the orchestra, even in a smaller orchestra setting. And you have to be able to project through all of that and still have the intimacy of a solo voice especially when you're projecting something as personal as this poetry. One of the movements of the Rückert Lieder, the final one, Um Mitternacht, at midnight, uh, it was written for all of the winds, brass, and timpani, and harp as the accompaniment. There's no strings in this movement. That's kind of an unusual and a daring move on Mahler's part. The winds and brass are usually used sparingly in vocal works so that they don't cover up the singer. But in this movement, he's going for a very particular dark and thick color. I think you'll really, really enjoy this. I really look forward to hearing Ms. McCarty's uh, performance of these. Now, the concert concludes 
with a very short work by Schumann. It's a really, really nice way to tie it off. It's a piece called the Abendlied, it's an evening song or serenade, if you will. Now this is from a set of piano pieces and it's been orchestrated in a number of ways. It's usually for a solo instrument, but we're gonna be performing it with the string orchestra in an arrangement by the Norwegian composer, Johan Svensson. He was a contemporary of Wagner, this composer. I think you'll agree that it's a really fitting end for this concert. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually performed it straight ataka from the Mahler with no break. It actually fits so beautifully into that set of beautiful melodic works, starting with the Blumina and going through the Rückert Lieder and ending with this Abendlied. So I hope you enjoyed these really, really brief explorations of the music of Schumann, of his contemporaries and those people whom he influenced. As always, I thank you for your support um, at this time. We're still hanging in there doing concerts, and I hope to see you next time.